Well, my name is Lloyd Spanky. I'm the Midwest Regional Manager for Manure Pump Sales for Cornell Pump. And I'm here today with Brandon Yoder. Brandon's uh, lead engineering tech at Cornell and uh, very, very knowledgeable in the construction and assembly of Cornell pumps. So we're here today to talk to you about maintenance and repair of Cornell manure pumps. And the run dry reservoir is to supply fluid to the seal area, which lubricates the seal when the, in cases of the pump running dry. Rotating assembly removed, we expose the inside of the pump, the inside of the volute, which has the suction cover and wear rings. So the pump that we are working on today is what we call one of our legacy pumps. It's uh, standard construction materials, mostly ductile iron construction. Um, and in the suction cover, uh, we have a hardened stainless wear, hardened stainless wear ring. And with the six and HTC 19, it's an L-shaped wear ring. And we also have a wear ring for the impeller. Uh, a lot of our a lot of our standard manure pumps don't have impeller wear rings, but with the the larger, higher pressure pumps, we we do put a, a suck or a, excuse me an impeller wear ring to be the sacrificial part. These are the first parts that are going to wear out on your Cornell pump. So. The wear ring is designed to be the sacrificial part. This is the first part that you're going to need to maintain. Um, and is designed to wear out before you start wearing into your suction cover. This piece is way more expensive to replace than this piece. It's, it's really important to keep an eye on these. And, and the amount of wear depends on what you're pumping. So, you know, I always tell people that at the very least, you should inspect your pump at the end of a pumping season to see how the wear looks. So as far as removing these, um, kind of more difficult with these L-shaped wear rings because and the hardened stainless wear rings. They're harder than any drill bit you're going to have. So drilling through them like our normal removal process is going to be quite difficult. So what you can do is you can cut a piece of uh, steel stock a little bit shorter than the ID of the wear ring. Put a heavy weld on each end that will pull that in. And then you also have something that you can now drive the wear ring out of the suction cover from the opposite side. For the impeller, usually a little bit of heat with a torch, you should be able to get it off. Um, or same thing, you can weld something to it that you can pry against or hit with a hammer to get it to come off. It's just a press fit, so all you need to do is get it to grow a little bit and it should slide off the wear ring of the impeller. If you're installing the impeller wear ring, what we do is we'll put them in an oven about 250 degrees, let it sit for a while, get it up to temperature. Welding gloves work okay, but they tend to not uh, protect you from the heat as well as you might think. So proper oven gloves work better. Uh, heat your wear ring up, starter step first, and then you're just going to slide it over the nose of the wear ring on the impeller. And then you want to hold it there and make sure that that impeller wear ring seats all the way onto the hub of the impeller. 
so what we're going to show you now is how to get your impeller off the Cornell pump. Cornell impellers on the majority of our manure pumps are threaded, so they have to be unscrewed from the shaft. We balance every Cornell impeller before it's put into a new pump, so it's not unusual to see grind marks like this on your impeller. And in fact, it's probably more of a concern if you don't see them uh, because hopefully somebody didn't forget to balance it. We call this a shaft wrench um, and you'll see why in just a few minutes. Uh, and these tools are available from Cornell um, and are make the impeller removal and installation a lot easier. Yeah, all, all of these repairs are a lot easier if you have your pump on a good solid workbench. From the impeller end, we're going to pick this up and slam it against the table and use the inertia of the impeller to loosen the threads. It's red Loctite, so you want to heat the, if you want to break the Loctite loose, you want to heat that lock screw up to glowing red. Um, preferably with a torch, and then let it cool back down. What that does is it'll melt the Loctite and then you'll be able to remove that. But you don't want to try to remove the lock screw while it's still hot. Um, you'll just twist it off. These are stainless lock screws, so they're a little bit softer than even like a grade five bolt. We do recommend using a new uh, impeller lock screw as the threads can get stretched and it's just always a good idea to, to use a new one. And with a new pump, within a, a couple hits like that, they generally come loose. After a pump's been in operation, the natural tendency for a threaded impeller during operation is to work like it's tightening itself on. So, you know, and depending how long it's been in operation and all the manure that goes through it, they can be definitely harder to get off than you've seen here. Instead of the shaft wrench, we take a spanner wrench and unthread it from the drive end of the pump. So now we're at the point where we'll, we will remove the mechanical seal and uh, there is a spring retainer. And to remove the rotating portion, uh, this being a new seal, Sometimes the rotating portion will come off fairly easily, but being your, one of the main reasons you're probably opening your pump up is to replace the mechanical seal. Uh, this rotating portion may, may be a lot harder to get off, so you'll have to use a pry bar typically to get it to, to move. And at this point, if your mechanical seal is, is bad, you're not really worried about trying to maintain the integrity of that part, but you just want to make sure that you're not messing anything up in the process, so. We have the rotating face of the mechanical seal and on a, on a worn or bad seal you can see a lot of times there will be chips or gouges and the, the seal face will 
appear hazy, which is a sign of wear. In the back plate, we've got the stationary face, which we're going to have to remove the back plate to, to do what we need to do with the stationary face. Cornell's calling cards is our cyclocele system, and cyclocele uh, involves the the back veins on the impeller and our dished back plate with the the knobs. And what this what this does is it creates a cyclic action with the liquid in the back plate area. And it forces the solids particles away from the seal area. Okay. Very, very gonna, gentle. It's not going to drop on it here. I don't think so. I think it's that last little edge. Okay. Oh. So now Brandon's going to remove the stationary face and on a new pump, this is a relatively easy operation, but, but again, uh, manure pumping is one of the hardest things on a pump and you get all kinds of stuff built up, rust and manure and packed in the area around the stationary face and it typically will not come out in one piece. So Brandon's using a screwdriver to evenly press on the edges of the stationary face as he goes around. When getting ready to reinstall the back plate, one of the main things you want to make sure you do is the seal board needs to be nice and clean. Um, you can take a, a scotch brite pad and uh, you don't, you, you want to be careful to where you're not taking any material out, but you need to get it good and clean, make sure there's no pitting, no imperfections. Uh, this has to be perfect to get a good seal with the O-ring on your stationary face going in. Um, and then the other thing you want to make sure you do is take a soapy water solution and lubricate your tri-seal and also make sure that these two faces are extremely clean. There's no gasket material that goes here. It's metal on metal. So you want to make sure that those surfaces are very clean. Soapy water. The bolts that hold the back plate to the bracket will get anti-seize. Okay, so Brandon is now going to show how we install the new seal and uh, with the seal for this pump, um, the six inch pumps like the six and HTC 19 have the closer seal. The stationary face is a tungsten material. Um, 
We also have a John Crane seal that we use for our manure pumps. And really the only difference between the two is the face material. The stationary face on the John Crane seal is a silicon material and it's not as heavy, uh, not as forgiving as the tungsten of the FlowServe seal. So, um, but in any case, you want to be extremely careful on installation of your seal. Don't touch the seal faces, um, and you'll see as Brandon's installing the stationary face, uh, we've got a, a piece of PVC uh, rounded, flat, sanded edges that he'll use to push it in, and it gives good even pressure, and it allows you to feel when that stationary face gets fully seated in the seal bore. So this is the same seal that we took out of the pump and I've gone ahead and cleaned it all up because we had grease and fingerprints on it. Um, you, what I did to do that is I just used a, a quick evaporating solvent, uh, similar to brake clean, carb clean, something like that. You want something that you can spray on, wipe off, and you don't want it to leave any residue. Uh, the next step, and you notice how I'm holding it, how Lloyd held it. We're not touching the faces. Um, just grease and dust from your fingerprints can cause leaks and cause the seal not to, to seal. So next we're going to lubricate the O-ring. We're going to use a little bit of heavyweight oil, um, just any kind of assembly lube, gear oil, something heavy, and we're going to use a light, light coating on that O-ring. And again, taking care not to touch the face. We're going to set that on the shaft and carefully set it up over the sleeve. In the previous segment, Lloyd talked about making sure that seal bore was nice and clean. Uh, a lot of times you'll get a rust ridge from the, on top of the O-ring. You're going to make sure that's all cleaned out, make sure the bore is nice and smooth. Uh, we're going to take our PVC. Always make sure everything's nice and clean. Cleanliness is your friend this, in this process. We're going to slide that over the shaft. Line up the O-ring on the bore. And what I like to do is I like to rock the pipe a little bit just to kind of get that O-ring to roll. And once it rolls, that seat should go in. If it gets crooked to one side too far, you want to stop, pull it back out, um, make sure you don't cut the O-ring or crack the seat uh, by applying too much force with it going in crooked. The next step is going to be the rotating element. Same thing, I've cleaned the face there, trying not to touch it. Um, we'll just apply our assembly lube to the rubber bellows. We just want a thin film. We don't want this to be sliding around too, too much on that sleeve. It's just enough to get that rotating element installed onto the sleeve. I always leave the sleeve dry. I, want, I don't want to accidentally touch the face to the end of the sleeve and have anises or um, any kind of oil or debris to be able to get on the faces. Uh, if, even if I bump the sleeve, I'll know that it's all clean and I won't have any issues to go ahead and push that rotating piece all the way on. And then I'm going to push from the back side here on the rubber. I'm going to push that, apply a little bit of pressure, and make sure it's all the way tight up against the other seal face. And the last thing is our spring. And the difference between a John Crane spring and a FlowServe spring is the FlowServe springs are tapered. I'm not sure if you'll be able to pick that up on camera or not. And you want to make sure that the correct diameter goes over the seal because if you get the wrong size over the seal, it's not going to seat correctly. 
it's not going to ride right, you're going to get uneven pressure and your seal is going to fail fairly quickly, if seal at all. To figure out which diameter is supposed to go over the seal, it's pretty easy. You can slide it on there. One size will fit perfectly around the rotating element. If I flip it over to be the wrong size, it'll fit over the top of the whole rotating element. So now we're getting ready to install, reinstall the impeller and we have our thrust washer and impeller shims. Now um, we're, we're going to start with the, the shims that we took off because that should get, get us back to where we want to be on our back vane to back plate clearance. So uh, the impeller shims need to go on first, followed by the thrust washer. And there is not a specific direction for that thrust washer to go on. Either way is fine. It's, it's symmetrical. We're going to apply a generous dose of anti-seize to those threads. And then reinstall our spring, put the correct ID on the rotating piece. Another note I want to make on the mechanical seal installation and the shaft sleeves specifically, we always recommend whenever you're changing your mechanical seal, putting in a new mechanical seal, you always put in a new shaft sleeve because all it, can, all it needs is just one small scratch, even a scratch that's hardly visible uh, to really make the difference between a successful seal installation and one that's gonna f could possibly fail in short order. So now we're going to install the impeller. This is just going to be the reverse of the removal. We're going to very carefully use the hoist to line up the threads to the threads on the impeller. And get them started here. I think I need to go down just a touch. If you wouldn't mind holding that Lloyd, I'll yeah. go turn the shaft. And we'll rotate the threads until it starts going on. Then if you feel a little bit of tension, I'll lower it down. There we go. And once again, I want to point out that we're supporting all of, all of the weight of the impeller by the hoist. And we're just threading the shaft into the impeller. We're not allowing the weight of the impeller to apply pressure and create friction and heat on those threads and induce galling. When you're threading the shaft in, you want to be feeling through your tool to make sure that if it's gritty or any kind of resistance that's beyond just, you know, misalignment, uh, you want to stop and address those issues. If there's any burrs, any stray threads, um, fix that before you hammer this on because if there's any kind of debris or anything like that it can cause major issues later. So now we've got the impeller hand tight. We're going to check the clearance before we tighten it down. I'm going to use a taper gauge. Uh, it's just a wedge that's graduated. You can use feeler gauges. This is just a little bit quicker. And what we're going to be checking is the gap between that back vein and the back plate. We're shooting for 30 thousandths. Usually when you tighten these threads up, you'll lose 10 to 15 thou. So we're gonna be looking for 40 to 45 before we tighten the impeller on. And we're right at 44, so that's perfect. And our shaft wrench is going back on. We're just gonna get it set up on the other side because instead of loosening, we're now going to be going to the right to tighten it. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and tighten the impeller on. The process I like to use for this is I'll tighten it a few times and I'm gonna mark where it lands. 
a mark on the back plate and a mark on the impeller. Tighten it a few more times until my mark on the impeller doesn't travel more than a quarter of an inch, a quarter of an inch each time. So first things, we'll tighten it up. I'm gonna mark a line on the impeller, a line on the back plate. I'm gonna go ahead and hit the table again. And you see my mark on the impeller has moved. So I'll mark on the back plate where that line now sits. We'll hit it again. It's moved again. And so now I'm getting down where it's not moving much more than a quarter of an inch each time. And I'm gonna stop there. I know the impeller's tight. What will happen is you can keep doing this over and over and over and you're gonna end up smashing that sleeve and compressing the sleeve. So you just wanna make sure that you're getting the impeller good and tight. And then we'll go ahead and install the lock screw so that it can't back off. So what we're shooting for is 30 thou plus or minus eight from the back vein to the surface of the back plate for our clearance. And we wanna check side to side to make sure we don't have any discrepancies from one side to the other. The next step is installing the impeller lock screw. We're gonna use red thread locker. Put a little dot on there. And this being a three quarter inch lock screw and stainless, we're gonna go to 135 foot-pounds. And we left our shaft wrench on the back end to keep the shaft from rotating. Turn it all the way. Right there. So now that we got the impeller back on and properly shimmed and tightened, we're gonna put this back together. So we're gonna start by putting the suction cover back on the volute. So when placing the suction cover back in place, we have a we have Cornell stamped in the casting, and if we if we get that at the top, it'll be aligned properly. So we're just going to use a block of wood to kind of protect our machine surfaces on our impeller as we roll this forward. In the R270 discharge position, bottom horizontal, where the majority of our manure pumps are positioned. In this case, with the frame mount foot, it would be at the bottom with the discharge. Just installing the run dry reservoir and hooking up the reservoir lines. Reservoir lines, it's important to make sure that the bottom hose is connected to the bottom port on the reservoir, top hose on the back plate connects to the top port on the reservoir. So the thing I want to discuss now is our MP pumps, which are probably the most popular pumps that we sell in the manure pump line to date. And this is a cutaway of our 6819 MPC pump, which is the most popular pump I'm currently selling on the manure side. This pump 
is designed to handle abrasive materials. Sand laden manure is the reason that this pump was developed. The difference between the MP pump and the legacy pump that we just worked on is largely materials of construction. The, the pump end is built out of what we call CAC, white iron material. It's the most abrasion resistant material that we currently use to build pumps with. And we now build the entire pump end Everything that the liquid touches is built out of CAC material with the exception of the suction cover because in the MP pump no liquid really contacts the su suction cover. We've got, a, we've got an internal wear plate that's built out of CAC material that all of the liquid contacts. This wear plate is adjustable so you can maintain your clearances as your, as your pump wears. You can adjust the wear plate in to keep these clearances tight to reduce wear and also keep your efficiencies high. The, the seal and everything, the back plate looks the same. Uh, the only difference there again is the material of construction. Uh, the seal installation is all the same. Um, you, don't have, you don't have wear rings to worry about on this pump because you've got this entire CAC white iron wear plate. So you're getting, you're getting the most wear capability that we can give you with this pump. I'm gonna go ahead and show you how we here at the shop adjust these wear plates on the MP series pumps. And the wear plate controls the axial clearance on the end of the impeller between this wear plate and the impeller there. Uh, it's controlled by these adjuster bushings, studs, and nuts right here located on the outside of the suction cover. To start your adjustment, uh, when you assemble the pump, it's easiest to pull the wear plate all the way back against the suction cover. That way you don't have any interference with the impeller and the wear plate during assembly. Once you get the whole pump assembled, we lay it down horizontal, we loosen the jam nuts on the stud, and then we'll tighten all of these adjuster bushings, there would be four, evenly so that the wear plate will come down and contact the face of the, wear, the impeller. And we'll tighten them down just hand tight. We don't want to crank it down. We don't want to mess, we don't want to take out the axial end play of the bearing frame. We just want the wear plate and the impeller to make contact. Once you get that all the way down and all of your adjusters are snug, we'll take a pen, we'll mark one point and, and make a corresponding mark on the suction cover itself. And then we're gonna back the adjuster back two points. And we're gonna do that on all four adjusters and what that does is it backs our adjusters out so that our wear plate can move away from the impeller. Each point or flat, however you count it, ends up being about 15 thousandths of clearance between the wear plate and the impeller. So backing that off two points gives us roughly 30 thousandths, which is what we're looking for. 20 to 30 is usually the range we try to land in. Uh, due to the axial end play in the bearing frame, we typically shoot for the higher number, which is 30 thousandths, and that, that allows us the movement of the, the bearing frame. So, we moved our flat, uh, our points, two points away from our mark. We're gonna hold our adjuster with one wrench. We'll tighten the nut down, and we're gonna tighten that down tight. And we're going to do that on all four studs. And then you can come back in with your feeler gauges and measure that we have between 20 and 30 thousandths between our wear plate and our impeller. And then rotate the shaft, make sure everything moves freely, and then your adjustment is done.